This week on Kentucky Afield, we're searching the state's beautiful waterways we got one. for one of its most interesting and rarest species. Next, we're getting you ready for deer season by showing you how to make a great mount 100% on your own. Then, oh, there goes another, there goes another rabbit right here behind it. <laughs> rabbit season is quickly approaching. Hey, buddy, oh shoot! And we can't wait. It's all next on Kentucky Afield. It's fun. I love it. Such a pretty fish. Beautiful. This pond is plumb loaded with frogs. They're everywhere in here. <laughs> yeah, this is a good fish right here. Really good fish. Come here, girl. Hey, boy. That's a big rabbit. Nice job. Yes! Yes! My first musk. First St. Leo! Yeah, we're here to get the keeper. There it goes! Yeah. Boom! Oh. Oh. Wow, that happened fast. Hello, and welcome to Kentucky Field. I'm your host, Chad Miles. Join us as we journey the Commonwealth in search of outdoor adventure. A hellbender, what is a hellbender? Many outdoors men and women have heard of it, but have never seen one. Hellbenders are our largest native species of salamander we have in Kentucky. They'll get to be probably two foot long, sometimes a little bit bigger than two foot long. They live entirely in streams, but not only in streams, they have to be in really high quality streams that have really large slab rocks, so big pieces of boulder that are pretty flat, and that's where they live their entire life. In the fall, time of year we're in right now, they'll actually start breeding, and the males will guard large egg masses that are underneath these rocks. Today is part of a project we've been doing for about two or three years now in collaboration with Purdue University. Some of the researchers from Purdue will come down and assist us in locating adult hellbenders. Everybody puts on wetsuits and snorkels and masks, and then it's just a matter of getting in the stream and snorkeling along, looking at the bottom of the stream for these really large slab rocks that a hellbender would like to live under. Once you find this big rock, or one of these big rocks, you essentially hold your breath, swim under the water, and use a flashlight and kind of stick your face up underneath the rock to look around and literally look and see if there's a hellbender staring you back in the face. Most of the time when you do that, you don't see a hellbender. Mostly there's darters, maybe some fish living underneath the rocks. I've seen a couple of fish yeah. that are wedged under the rocks. Yeah. Yeah, it's got me excited. Occasionally we'll find a turtle, big snapping turtle, something like that that's living underneath there. That's a big one. You got one? No, there's a big snapping turtle over here. Oh. We got one. Swimming along, we found the first one. Everybody went over and checked it, and before we started trying to pull legs out, we wanted to get a pretty good survey of the site. So within five minutes, we found a second one. Hey, we got another one over here. So we found two hellbenders so far. We're gonna keep moving upstream, see how many guarding males we can find. And then after we do that, we'll come back to the known sites or the known rocks and start using a probe to hopefully pull some eggs out. And I think within maybe an hour and a half or so, we had four hellbenders that we'd located in maybe a 100 meter section of stream. Then it's just a matter of using probes to see if we can get the males that are guarding the nest, get them to move out of the way enough to where we can run this probe in there and start pulling eggs out. He won't move. He's not especially aggressive, but he is just blocking the hole. We might come back to him later if we don't get something else. Okay. They're guarding them for a reason. They're wanting to protect these eggs. So it's a little bit of a fight to get that probe past the male. Luckily, we've got three more down here. We're gonna try those. We can't get any from those. We'll try to come back and uh, hit this guy again. Hopefully get some eggs out. We were able to go to the second hellbender at that point. The rock there wasn't as large. We were able to really get back in them within five minutes or so of probing, started pulling eggs out. 
typically what happens is you'll get in there and maybe pull out one or two eggs to start with, but then as you continue to get further back into that rock, further back in past the adult male, you can start pulling out pretty large masses of these eggs out from underneath the rock. Yeah, we're starting to get some eggs coming out now. We'll put them in a cooler and folks from Purdue will take them back to their lab where they will raise these up into adult hellbenders. And the whole reason we do that is in the wild, if a clutch of eggs has maybe 500 in it, you're lucky to get maybe five to 10 adult hellbenders to actually survive out of that clutch of 500, maybe one to 2%. But if we take these eggs back to the lab, they can get a 60 to 70% survival ship there, which gives us a lot more hellbenders that we can then bring back to our Kentucky streams and hopefully repopulate some of the streams that used to have good populations that don't anymore. Having pretty good success so far pulling the eggs out. Haven't had good luck yet on getting the actual adult male out of the nest, so hopefully we can find another one. Put your goggles back on and watch this corner of the rock. I think the hellbender might come out this side. Okay. He had actually a second chamber that he could use to exit the rock from. So at that point, we had agitated him to the point to where he was ready to abandon ship and leave whatever eggs he had there and try to find a place to get away from us. So I was able to grab him and put him into a net so that we could take him back, process him, see how big he was, how much he weighed, if he had any sort of health problems, and really check him over to see what sort of health he was in. In studying the life cycle a little bit from what we've seen so far, most of what we're encountering in the wild with our hellbender population are really old hellbenders. So this is a species that can live for multiple decades. 51 centimeters. Total length. Funding for this project has been a mix, not only of federal funding that Kentucky Department of Fish and Wildlife gets, but it's also funding through the Kentucky Wild Program. Kentucky Wild is a program where citizens, not just in Kentucky, but around the US or the world, can contribute to the department, and 100% of that funding is used for research projects like this. We're done with the adult at this point. We've done all the measurements that we've needed, checked him over, make sure he's in good health. Now we'll take him back and put him back underneath the rock that we got him out from a few minutes ago. I'm here today with Kyle Sams, who's the Acting Deer and Elk Program Coordinator. Kyle, a big part of your job is collecting samples and analyzing samples throughout the state of Kentucky, right? That's correct. So what we have here looks like a normal freezer, but this actually is more than that. It's one of the ways that you are reaching out to hard to reach areas for deer samples, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tell me a little bit about this program. So this program we're initiating this year is basically called a Deer Sample Collection Station. And we're going to put these out um, 12 different locations throughout the state and basically giving hunters the opportunity to voluntarily surrender their deer head for sampling of chronic wasting disease. Okay, when you say voluntary surrendering, it's like you take your deer, you process all your deer, but you leave a very small neck piece up at the top mm -hmm. in the head. You can still mount your deer, it doesn't affect any of that. And then you literally put it in a black bag, zip tie it, provide the information needed stick the bag in here and you're done, right? Correct. So, and then a, a certain time later after all the samples are done, that, that uh, individual, that hunter who donated their deer will get some information back, right? Correct. They'll learn to whether or not their, their deer is chronic wasting disease positive or, or if it's not detected, and they'll also learn uh, what the age is of that animal. We'll also provide general information of where that deer come from um, and stuff like that, that to, to the specific hunter. Okay, now we've never had chronic wasting in the state of Kentucky, right. but we have to continue looking. We're gonna continue looking for chronic wasting and this is just another way we get additional samples. How many samples are we hoping to collect this year? We're looking to collect around 2,000 to 2,500 samples. Okay, we can't be at every location at every time, so the best way to do that is to get a hunter to mm -hmm. give us this deer head, allow us to process it, and take care of that for you. A lot of people are kind of looking for that basic information on age anyhow. Yeah, we'll have our biologists look at these and all of them are, are great at aging deer. So we'll give, be able to give you a specific age. So how do you find out more about this program and how do you locate one of these, these drop-off locations? Yeah, so you could go to our website. It's fw.ky.gov forward slash CWD. And there will be information on there that provides you uh, the locations of where these are at and how to participate in the program. 
And obviously, if you come across a deer that looks to be sick or has any problems, you want anyone out there, hunter or non-hunter, to reach out and make sure that we get a, an opportunity to sample that as well. Yeah, absolutely. If you see a sick deer uh, or elk or any animal for that matter, call us and we'll, we'll respond appropriately. Well, Kyle, I really appreciate your hard work on this program. Hey, you can't have too much data, right? That's right. The more data, the better. Whitetail deer season here in Kentucky is in full swing, and there are many different ways to preserve your trophy, including a European mount. So I'm here with Chase Wallen today, and we're here to demonstrate a way that a person can preserve a deer hunt without spending a ton of money on a taxidermist. Yeah, absolutely. The Euro mount's a very cost-effective method. And this Euro mount is all about removing hair and flesh and getting it down to just literally bone. Yeah, correct. Bone and antler, right? Yeah, yeah you're gonna remove the flesh, you're gonna clean the skull, and essentially there you go. Well, it just so happened that one of our videographers, Jameson Standard, took a really nice buck, and he is going to allow us to demonstrate this process today. This is a way that we can showcase exactly how to do this for someone who may want to try it. We're gonna go ahead and get started. So what you're gonna need is a set of sharp knives, some rubber gloves to protect your hands, a couple pairs of needle nose pliers. I like to use a large pair and a small pair. The same with a set of flathead screwdrivers, gun cleaning picks, peroxide developer paste, some small paint brushes, and some cups to hold your peroxide developer, clear dishwashing liquid, super glue, electrical tape, and then of course your pot and your pan and your burner. The first step is we're gonna remove all the hide, the ears, the nose, and then some of the meat that we can get off. So biggest thing you want is a deboning knife that's got a little bit of flexibility to it, just so you can get in and around all the intricate parts of the head. So when you're doing this, you really wanna be careful with your knife cuts and you do not want to cut down into the bone. We're just gonna keep peeling the hide down away from the mouth. You wanna be careful around here so you don't cut or scrape up the teeth. And you're just gonna keep continuing to work this hide all the way down. And you do not have to worry about taking this hide off in one piece. If you need to, it's perfectly fine to section it out, peel a piece, and then start on another one, section it out, and keep peeling all the way down to the nose. At this point, we have all the hide removed. So what we're gonna do is go through and remove as much excess meat off the skull as possible. At this point, you don't wanna use a whole lot of downward pressure on the nose because you don't wanna shatter these delicate bones. You wanna go in and remove the tongue and the eyes. They do boil out if you'd rather do that. It just helps to get that hot water down into the cavity quicker. Where you want your water temperature is just a really low simmer. You absolutely do not need a rolling bowl for this. Every 30 to 45 minutes, you need to go back and check your water temperature and your water level as this will evaporate over time. Okay, we're in about hour three, just about ready to take it out and pressure wash it. Around hour two, we pulled this out, put it on the table and pulled the majority of the meat off with the needle nose pliers. It's a really important step. We removed the jawbone and got off as much as we possibly could to allow it to continue cooking in the last hour. We put it back in and as you can see, whenever we removed all that meat, it drastically reduced the weight on the front end and causes it to tip forward. We rigged up a little apparatus to help hold it up. You may need to do the same. Prior to pressure washing, I like to remove the two lower nose bones just because they're so fragile and I don't want to break them. After you get them removed, and dried, it's easy to glue them back in later. Before we get started, what I like to do is put down a towel just to kind of protect the skull and to keep anything from blowing up against it. I also like to set it up against a hard surface to prevent it from spinning around while you're pressure washing it. And another thing, I like to wear some knee-high rubber boots. There's gonna be a bunch of nasty debris fly off of this and you don't wanna get it on you. Now that we've got the front sprayed off, what we're gonna do is flip it over, pat up the bottom really well where these really delicate nose bones are gonna be, stick the end of the pressure washer in the spinal column hole and flush out the brain matter. Oh, 
Okay, so now we've got all the meat sprayed off and it's on to the next step. Sometimes a pressure washer can miss small pieces of meat, especially in the nasal cavity. So it's a good idea to go in and remove any from the skull. So now we're gonna soak the skull in a pot of water with some clear dishwashing soap. This helps remove any oils or grease from the skull. Absolutely make sure it's clear. You don't have to do this, but it helps speed the process if you have a heat lamp next to the container. The warm water helps to draw the oils out faster. Let this soak for two to three weeks, changing the water every three to four days, maybe a week, or if it looks like it gets cloudy. So we've removed the skull from the water and let it completely dry. Prior to this, we went in and we pre-whitened this section of the nose bone and the corresponding section of the skull, just so that it'll make glue up a little bit easier and no color will bleed through. Next step, we're gonna attach the nose bones with the glue, and then we're gonna whiten the entire skull with the cream developer peroxide paste. So with these nose pieces, make sure and dry fit it first prior to putting the glue on it. Just in case a piece of bone has shifted or maybe something's out of line, you can go in with some sandpaper or maybe a fine file, file it down where it meets up a little bit easier. This one's meeting pretty good, so we're gonna go ahead and glue it. What I like to use is just a normal super glue. You wanna use something that's not water soluble and not heat soluble. That way you don't have to have any kind of worries or, or anything with it coming apart on you. But you'll put just a dab of glue where it's gonna meet the skull. And I like to put a dab of glue on the inside of the nose bone. And it is super glue, so you do have to act pretty quickly. We're just gonna hold it till it dries. It's time for the other side. Now that the nose bones are dry, we're gonna go ahead and apply the peroxide cream developer paste. Prior to doing that, a good idea is to take just some simple electrical tape and wrap the base of your antlers. That way, none of the developer paste gets up onto the colored antler and you don't have to worry about it bleaching it out. I like to go three to four inches up the antler. So now that we got those wrapped, we're gonna go ahead and apply the paste. What we're using here is a peroxide cream developer paste. You can pick this up from any salon or even Amazon. Today we've got 40% by volume, which is about 12% peroxide, which is as strong as you can get over the counter. We're gonna go ahead and just apply a thin coat of the paste over the top of the entire skull. It helps to have a small brush so you can get down into the nooks and crannies in this cartilage and get the developer paste all throughout. So I also like to get this really good up in between each individual tooth. The teeth typically hold a little bit more oil and they'll be a little bit more discolored than the rest of the bones, so they may take two or three applications. Once you have all this applied, let it dry six to eight hours overnight is best. Once it's dried, you need to go in and maybe take a stiff bristle brush and rinse it under hot water and scrub all the remaining peroxide off. Then once it's dried, you can evaluate it. If it's to the point of being as wide as you want, good. If not, all you have to do is go back and reapply the paste and continue the process until you get it to where you want it. A European mount takes a little bit of time and it's a few steps, but it's a great, inexpensive, and very memorable way to commemorate your harvest. Kentucky's rabbit season in the eastern zone begins on November the 1st, and for me, it can't get here soon enough. Well, Joseph, we finally found time to get out and take this hunt. You called me and said, hey, I got some property in Simpsonville and you wanted to rabbit hunt it. You know, it's taking a little bit of time, we finally put it together. This is my mom and dad's farm. Of course, we own a, some acreage in Nelson County. I haven't hunted this particular property in probably six years or so, so I'm looking forward to it. It's a little bit wet today, but I guess uh, they'll probably trail better. Hopefully, we'll see. I brought two dogs here. One of these dogs I'm part owner in, the other one's my uncle's dog. They've been out several times, so I think that they'll do a pretty good job. You actually brought family and friends with you today. Yeah, my brother-in-law, Dave, and then... Uh, Brandon. Brandon. <laughs> <laughs> I just met him this morning. Oh, okay. But yeah, we had our open spot. Well, hey, these dogs are ready. I'm ready. Let's go get after it. What do you think? Yeah. Sounds good. First miss buys the first cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Go get a crab baby. Hop in there. 
Looks like a spot I can imagine some rabbits being. I love watching these beagles, they start working. How excited they get when they first jump that first rabbit. They just can't control themselves. Rabbit right there. Now let's let the dogs run it. Oh, there goes another Here goes another rabbit right here behind us. <laughs> we got rabbits going everywhere. They're 130 yards, and somehow they've lost it. I'll tell you one thing, those rabbits held pretty tight. Right there where it turns there, Chad? Yeah. There is a uh, dried up pond there, and uh, there's a lot of holes in there, in the bank and everything, you know? These dogs are acting like they ran it into a hole because they have just stopped. This piece of property we're on, we're not very far from the interstate, real close to where the city is coming in and kind of taking you over out here, isn't it? Well, yeah, we're in Simpsonville, and as everybody knows, the Outlet Mall was built out here. Of course, when I was growing up, this was all farmland, but gradually disappearing. Of course, that's an issue statewide, but particularly in Simpsonville with 64 running through it and uh, its proximity to Louisville. But this is where I grew up. In some ways, it's sad to see, but you know, there's still plenty of places out there that you can hunt. Good shot. There you go. Nice job, Brandon. Say dead. 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 Better get it from her. She'll want to haul it off. That's a big bunny. Yeah. Nice job. I'd like to get the other one, too. <laughs> There's definitely another one There's in here. There's definitely another one in here. Hey, bunny. Oh, shoot. Did you get it? I hit it. Tally ho, tally ho, tally ho, tally ho, tally ho, tally ho. Tally ho, tally ho, tally ho. Look at a hair right here. You get it? Yeah, he did. There we go, that's our second bunny. We've already jumped five rabbits, and I'm telling you, we've not, we've went less than 150 yards. And we've seen another rabbit in here, so we're gonna get right back in here and get busy. Dogs are working it right now, trying to straighten it out. This was a cooperative effort. I shot this rabbit in here, and it trickled out and we didn't want to let it get away, so uh, Joseph here finished it off. Oh, so. shoot, right there, right, right here. here. Rabbit, hey, rabbit, hey. rabbit. <whistles> Going backwards. Right here. Oh, you got him? Nope. You got him? Yeah, dead rabbit. <laughs> here I was putting my rabbit in my pack and I hear you say, there he goes. I couldn't get a shot. Man, you put a nice shot on that bunny. Yeah. That was yeah, it's, uh, it's thick in here, it's tough shots. There's so many rabbits, I think it's confusing the dogs a little bit because we've jumped three or four rabbits in this area. It's perfect habitat for rabbits. So let's get in here and stomp around a little more and see if we can't get a good chase going on. All righty. Nice job. Anytime you're rabbit hunting, you wanna make sure you're wearing a hunter's orange hat and preferably a vest as well. But this time of year, modern firearm season is in. So we know there are deer hunters in these woods. They're not on the property that we're hunting, but you definitely want to make sure you're wearing plenty of hunter's orange when you're out rabbit hunting for your own safety and definitely for potential involvement or interference with a deer hunter. Oh, there he goes, rabbit. Get it? Yeah, I got him. <laughs> this one's a little bigger than the last one, but it's fun, I love it. Joseph, I appreciate you having us out today. Oh, it's no problem. It turned out to be a really good day. We were expecting rain, but it tailed off right where we needed it to tail off. We still got a four or five hour hunt in. Got four bunnies, ran plenty of rabbits. Let me know when you're ready to do it again. All right, sounds good. Now let's check in and see who else has been out having fun in this week's Ones That Didn't Get Away. Sawyer Moore of Jessamine County knows how to start off hunting. That's small game hunting. Here he is with a squirrel. Nice job. 11-year-old Jameson Roger got his very first deer during the youth weekend in Owen County. Congratulations. Here we have Haley Hacker with her very first buck ever, and it's a nice one. Congratulations. Here we have Carter Brown of Russell Springs who took his very first buck during the youth firearm season. Nice job. Here we have seven-year-old Summer Clark of Graves County, Kentucky, with their very first deer taken during the youth firearm season. Congratulations. 
Here we have a really impressive 11 point buck taken by Connor Mitchinson. This deer was taken in McLean County during the youth weekend. Caden Epperson is super happy. That's because he caught his first large bass on a topwater popper. Congratulations. Here we have Landon Thompson with his first real nice buck. He's 10 years old and this deer was taken with a firearm in Marshall County. Nice deer. Hey, remember, this upcoming weekend, October the 17th and the 18th, is the Kentucky early muzzleloader season. And remember, hunting and fishing on private property is a privilege. Always ask permission and thank the landowner. Until next week, I'm your host, Chad Miles, and I hope to see you in the woods or on the water.